Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Dash, and I'm President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. We know that many of you listening today are on the front lines of managing the COVID-19 emergency as it continues to evolve at rapid speed. The Alliance is committed to remaining a resource amidst this turbulent time. Over the next three days, from noon to 12.30 Eastern Time, we will bring you experts to discuss the trajectory of the pandemic and the risks of a surge in cases. Our speakers will provide perspective from the front lines as the healthcare system responds to the crisis and highlight policy levers available to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus. Today, I am pleased to present the first session in our rapid response series. During today's webinar, we will discuss flattening the curve, a term that has emerged as both a rallying cry for a collective response to the outbreak, as well as a public health imperative to reduce the severity of COVID-19 in the US and around the world. I'm so pleased to be joined who is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Uni University of Kentucky College of Public Health. She is an expert in immunizations and vaccine preventable diseases. Prior to joining the college in 2016, Dr. Winter worked as an epidemiologist in the immunization branch of the California Department of Public Health and has more than 15 years of experience in communicable disease surveillance, prevention, and control. She is also a faculty affiliate with the University of Kentucky Perinatal Research and Wellness Center. Before we begin, the Alliance for Health Policy gratefully acknowledges the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for supporting today's webinar. If you are interested in joining the Twitter conversation, use the hashtag AllHealthLive and follow us at AllHealthPolicy. I'm going to briefly orient you all to the GoToWebinar platform and review some technical notes. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface you should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You can click the orange arrow to minimize and maximize this menu. When you join today's webinar, you were muted, and you will be throughout the presentation. Please use the question panel to chat with us about any technical issues you may be experiencing. You may send in questions for the panelists at any time, and we will collect them and address them during the broadcast. Now, Dr. Winter, Kathleen is going to make a few minutes of opening remarks, and then we will turn to your questions. Again, submit questions using the question section in the audience interface at any time during the webinar. Later today, you will also find all of the materials that accompany this webinar, including the slides and selected experts about COVID-19 on our website. We will be updating the resources list as additional articles and analyses are released, and a recording of today's webinar will be made available as well. Now, I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Kathleen Winter to make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here and to present to all of you this very urgent last minute of presentation. So there may be some uh, little errors here. We're pulling the data together as quickly as it's becoming published. So um, please bear with me and go on to the next slide. So globally, we've had over 200,000 cases reported thus far. Um, nearly every continent has been affected. Over 8,000 fatalities have been reported. So that's a global case fatality rate of 4%. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this map that's shown below. These data are being tracked through Johns Hopkins University. And it's a great way to get up-to-date information on what's happening and what cases have been reported across the world and, and in the US. So we have major epidemics occurring now with sustained local transmission in many countries and continents, um, all over Europe, China, of course, um, Iran, South Korea, and in the US. And we continue, we will continue to see further spread. Next slide. So as of yesterday in the US, there were over 4,000 confirmed cases, including 75 deaths, at least 17, possibly 
15 of those deaths were associated with the long-term care facility in Seattle, Washington. And that's where the first major introduction and outbreak occurred in the US. And that when a long-term care facility with a very vulnerable population is affected, we can see an explosive and very severe outbreak occurring um, and lots of fatalities. Nearly every state has reported a case thus far, and many states are reporting sustained local transmission. Next slide. This is the epidemic curve of cases that have been reported here in the United States. These data are coming in quickly and piecemeal, so it's not complete. Um, and we also know that um, people who are just now starting to become sick probably have not yet been diagnosed and reported. So we expect the curve to continue to uh, be sustained or potentially increase and not, not decline, as you see there. Um, but we are seeing increases across the board. Next slide. So the current data on the infectiousness of COVID-19, um, often we use a, a metric called the reproduction number or the R0 to estimate this. And the, this indicates the number of individuals each case is expected to infect in a population where everybody is susceptible. Um, so the R0 estimate for COVID is somewhere around 2.2, 2.3, depending on the different studies that have looked at this. Um, which is about as, as uh, what we saw during the SARS outbreak. It's, it's very similar. Um, and this is more infectious than what is estimated with regular influenza and uh, that we see seasonally, and even the pandemic flu estimates that we've seen. Next slide. The incubation period, which is the time from which an individual is exposed to the disease to when they go on uh, onset of, you can go to the previous slide, please, is estimated to be between two and 14 days. Um, so, but the average is around five days. So we expect from the time that somebody's exposed to when they start to show symptoms, it's around five days, but can be up to two weeks. You can go to the previous slide. Or to SARS, uh, we saw incubation period of around and we use serial interval time from the onset the onset of a case so from propagation other and that's approximately Dr. Wynn. Um, I just have to pause. Just pause the webinar.
This is Kathleen. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue. So the initial symptoms of COVID that we've seen thus far reported uh, primarily from China and um, Italy is that the initial symptoms start with fever, cough, and shortness of breath, so very nonspecific uh, illnesses that you see with many other viruses, in, including the flu. Uh, but what happens with this is it can progress to a viral pneumonia over the course of the next several days. Um, the, the radiographic images are very characteristic. They seem to have a ground glass appearance. Um, however, we know that some infections among children and young adults. And we know that asymptomatic transmission is known to occur. And this can be in individuals who are before they have become symptomatic or um, individuals who never become symptomatic. Next slide. So th um, these data come from a study from China looking at hospitalized cases. And what I want to point out here um, is that there these individuals were sick for a very long time. So of the 191 hospitalized individuals, 26% of them were admitted to the ICU. They're, they were in the ICU for an average of eight days. And the time from their disease onset to their ICU admission was 12 days. Um, and the time from their onset to when their final disposition occurred, whether they died or were discharged, was three weeks. Um, so it's a it's a slow illness. It's it's not kind of a rapid progressing um, aggressive illness that we saw with SARS. This seems to be a little bit slower progressing initially, um, with the more severe presentation occurring several days into the illness. Next slide. So our current estimates on the severity are a little hard to interpret because we don't know the overall denominator of who is infected with this virus. Um, so we use the case fatality rate, which is the number of deaths um, divided by the number of individuals who are lab confirmed or diagnosed. But we know that the more severe cases or even just the symptomatic cases are the ones that get included typically in that denominator. So if the the scope to which the asymptomatic cases are occurring is still very much unknown. But of the study of uh, the first 72,000 cases in China, 2.3% um, of those confirmed cases were fatal. And of, of those cases, um, not the fatal cases, but of the whole, the 45,000 cases, um, eight, around 80% were considered um, mild to moderate disease, which meant that they did not require hospitalization. So they may have been quite ill for you know extended period of time, but they ultimately did not require hospitalization. 14% did require hospitalization and 5% were critically ill requiring ICU care. There was a higher case fatality rate reported among individuals with pre-existing conditions such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer, and a much higher fatality rate reported among elderly individuals over the age of 80 and over the age of 70. And you can see on the graph to the right, the comparison of the, the death rate by age uh, with regular flu, compared to COVID. So you can see quite a dramatic increase, um, particularly in the middle age and older adult age group. Now what's interesting is that of the first 45,000 cases from China, only 2% of those cases were younger than 20 years of age. Um, and we saw around 4% were healthcare workers. Next slide. Viruses are of particular concern when they come into a population because they have never before infected humans. And so once they emerge, they can burn through a population and infect a lot of people quickly because no one, no one has background immunity to that virus. Everyone is susceptible. And this is different from uh, something like seasonal flu, uh, which is depicted 
below that's a more more accurate model of transmission because with seasonal influenza we do have some partial immunity in the population some people have been vaccinated some people have been exposed to the same virus previously and so when when we do have transmission it doesn't spread through like wildfire typically it usually is a little bit slower progressing so even though um, influenza is infectious it's not as infectious as covid and COVID can, can spread through the population much faster. Next slide. And this is why we have such an important emphasis on trying to slow transmission through social distancing measures. Um, so this is where this whole expression of flatten the curve is coming from. Even though widespread transmission of this virus may be inevitable, it is critically important that we slow the spread of this virus in the population. Because if it, it, it spreads quickly, we will have a major increase in cases requiring critical care, and we simply do not have the healthcare capacity to meet that need. However, if we can slow the spread and, and have cases come in more as a trickle instead of a, you know, a fire hose, then we can start to really treat each patient appropriately and we do not um, exceed the healthcare system capacity. Next slide. So we use uh, different measures for containment and mitigation with infectious disease. Um, containment strategies are when we're really trying to stop the spread altogether. Um, and we use strategies like isolating the sick and quarantining the exposed. Um, those involve very intensive case investigations, routine infection control practices, uh, contact tracing, and putting individuals in isolation and quarantine. They're very labor intensive and require lots of personnel to do this and will not ultimately be feasible once a community reaches a point where there is sustained ongoing transmission with lots of cases reported. So then we're really forced into only using uh, social distancing. Um, closing schools, canceling public events, closing public spaces and restaurants, and all these different um, now closures that we're seeing nationwide and we've seen all over the world. Next slide. A lot of the data on social distancing actually comes from the 1918 influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu. And this pandemic occurred in a few different waves, um, but Several cities implemented a very aggressive social distancing measures like we are doing now. Um, and you can see the graph, the smaller graph on the bottom shows two different cities, um, St. Louis, which did use more social distancing measures versus Philadelphia that did not. And you can see the progression and the different curves um, occurring in those two cities. Next slide. So we've had a lot of questions about laboratory testing and why we are not doing more testing and, and why can't we just ramp that up in order to do better case finding. Um, certainly um, having lots of testing and, and accurate case finding would, would be optimal in terms of really understanding the spread of this disease and the best ways to do a lot about the testing kits and we've heard a lot about that in the news. Um, but that's only one part of the story. So testing kits are available at all state and, and some local public health laboratories, but the capacity in each of those sites varies. Some have lot, a lot more capacity than others. Um, and there's different criteria being applied to determine which patients qualify for those, those tests um, based on the local capacity. There are now commercial labs that are offering testing, though the turnaround time for many of those is around three to four days. And so that's very difficult if you're dealing with an infectious, potentially infectious patient in a healthcare setting um, or, or anywhere, someone who's in a, um, a sensitive location and we really need to know whether or not they're a case. But the other piece that's important is that we have a limited supply of specimen collection kits. We use a nasopharyngeal swab to do this test and you need viral transport media. These are not um, supplies that every single provider has. And the most important piece is that not all providers have access to the essential personal protective equipment that is needed to do the specimen collection. And this includes an N95 respirator, 
or a surgical mask when supplies are limited, and they are limited. Um, we, they need eye protection, which must be goggles or a face shield, gown, and gloves. Next, the next slide, you can see the, the different elements of the PPE that are required. And these are not uh, supplies that would be typically seen in every single provider office. Um, and even in hospitals where they do have access to these types of supplies, um, it's not necessarily um, readily available at all times. Next slide. Next slide. In the works, in the pipeline, with several different reasons. Um, there has been a can protein, which is part of, of the virus. The phase one trials are beginning. Uh, phase one trials are to be at least for information and well in the fifth slide. So just in conclusion, I wanted to highlight that this this precedent and I think we um we've been sunk in across what's also important in this outbreak here in the Using to slow burden on the healthcare system can actually flatten that. Known about this virus, we don't fully how much asymptomatic. I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you so much to, to you, Dr. Winter, for, for a great overview of this issue. And um, just as a reminder to everybody, um, the slides will be posted on the Alliance website following this session. So it's now time for a Q&A. If you have a question, please uh, do post it in the question session. And, and just because of some of the technical issues that we were experiencing, I'm just going to ask if um, Dr. Winter, if you are able to stay for an extra five or so minutes after the um, the end of the the webinar, just to answer additional questions, would that be okay? We'll, we'll hope so. <laughs> All right. Um, so sure. Thank you so much. All right. I want to ask you a question about. Um, this question about timing. You talked about social distancing as being essentially the, the best tool that we have at the moment to contain the spread of the virus and to flatten the curve. How important is timing? How much time do we have to make these kinds of decisions to close schools, um, restaurants, bars, et cetera? And I'm and, sorry, and I cannot hear on this. Uh, Kathleen, we still can't hear you. I am sorry. I'm going to ask you to call back in uh, if you Hi, can. I'm just going to ask you to call back in again, everybody. We apologize this for that. Can't hear you. All right. While Kathleen is calling back in, can um, can we get some more questions from the audience in the Q and A panel?
Hi, this is Kathleen. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I think we <laughs> overloaded the All right, so let's answer this time <laughs> question. Um, how much time do we have to make these decisions on social distancing? And uh, understanding that they're obviously very challenging decisions for people economically and otherwise. That's right. Yes, that's right. Um, and so we do know with social distancing that when we apply a lot of different measures and we do it aggressively in the beginning, it has the best impact on reducing the spread of transmission. There's no exact answer on what measures all have to be implemented and, and where and how, um, but it's, it's the best tool that we have and being aggressive does seem to work better. Um, but of course, it is very cha challenging, and I think there are so many different elements to this that we're only just starting to understand what the long-term ramifications might be. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have an audience question. Um, can you get COVID-19 twice, or do, do we, people have immunity if we have it once? I think we've seen some reports of people who initially recovered and uh, maybe tested negative and then suddenly got sick again. What do we know about that so far? Yeah, so that's another area that's not fully understood. So we do know that the virus um, is shed in different sites, you know, either in the oral pharyngeal, you know, respiratory secretions um, or in feces at different points in time throughout the course of the illness. Um, it's also possible when we're doing laboratory detection with a PCR that you're you're capturing viral material, but it's not. A, viable. Um, so if somebody tested negative and then positive, it's possible they have a very um, kind of low level of viremia. Um, so, you know, we hope that that there is long-term immunity from exposure to, to coronavirus, this coronavirus, um, but it's not, not fully known yet what that will look like and, um, and that's still under investigation. Great, thanks. We have another uh, question that is just a little bit of a follow-up to the social distancing question. Based off of what we know on the social distancing and quarantine measures taking place in China, how long do we expect the U.S. will have to social distance? Will there be a time at which it is no longer useful? That's a great question, um, and it's a difficult one to answer because I'm not sure anyone really knows. So in Wuhan, China, they are beginning to lift some of their very stringent social distancing measures. Um, and whether or not we will see another increase in disease, another wave, uh, will probably inform what we decide to do in the U.S. and, and what is done in other countries. So um, we... The nice thing about social distancing is that we keep people away from each other, but once we start letting them back into contact with each other, we could still see another spike in disease incidents. Great. So question about um, question about testing. Um, we know the testing is limited right now. Can you talk a little bit about what impact is that having on the epidemiology, on the case numbers that are being reported? And as more tests are deployed, or if more tests are deployed in the near future, can you talk about that impact as, as more cases are reported? And, and what does that do to the projections? So as we have better access to testing, we will start detecting more and more mild disease, um, even potentially asymptomatic disease if testing were able to be deployed to that level uh, where individuals who were not sick were able to get tested. But at this time, we do not have access to testing to be able to do widespread testing. So even individuals who are sick, who are having symptoms that are suspicious for COVID, um, many of them do not have access to testing because their primary care physicians do not have the capacity to do the specimen collection. And even if they were to do it, it would put them and their staff at risk of contracting the virus. So um, we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that only providers who are fully protected are doing the specimen collection. Um, so if we can ramp up testing and figure out a way to, to get people <laughs> specimens collected safely, um, then we will have increases in cases reported and it probably will see a decline in the case fatality rate because many of those cases will be more mild and occurring in the outpatient setting. 
Great, thanks. So let's let's talk just a little bit more about testing because I think there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, you mentioned several barriers to testing, the lack of supplies being one of them, not only the testing supplies themselves, but protective equipment for the healthcare providers doing the testing. Can you talk a little bit about what, what will it take going forward to get the testing supplies and equipment and infrastructure that, that we need uh, going forward? What, 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 and what is being done? So I would say that the answers to those questions are a little bit outside of my expertise um, because the, you know they're really health um, they're really healthcare questions and um, the public health does not have the infrastructure to to do uh, widespread patient testing that's just not something that they have capacity for um, in the healthcare the public health infrastructure in the United States. Um, so the real question is how can can individuals, um, patients, access testing through their their regular healthcare networks, and that is very challenging. And I think a lot of healthcare um, systems really want to limit testing because if it's not going to change how you treat the patient, there's no treatments to offer patients who test positive for COVID. Um, so if the recommendation from your provider is going to be stay, to stay home and get some rest and, you know, keep a good watch of your symptoms, if you're having trouble breathing, come back to the hospital, um, then we don't really need to test. We can just tell people to do that anyway and not put the healthcare providers at risk um, by having the testing done. Okay, and we're going to get a little bit more into that in tomorrow's webinar, where we're going to have uh, the COO of Ascension Health as a major health system and, and a uh, public health expert getting into a little bit more of those dynamics. Um, can you talk just a little bit from your perspective, uh, you know, knowing that we don't really have a treatment available, uh, just briefly, if you could touch on anything related to vaccine development and why that's going to be important to the epidemiology and um, again, we'll get into more of the details of where we are with vaccine development at a later time. Yeah, I think our goal would be to slow transmission down sufficiently that once a vaccine becomes available and could be deployed, that it could be distributed to those people at highest risk, you know, the healthcare workers and those with pre-existing conditions or other complications that might put them at higher risk. So if we can protect those people now, but through social distancing and keeping them isolated, um, you know, that is, then maybe we can slow the spread to those individuals and um, protect them later. Great, thanks. Let me go back to some of the, uh, the, the initial data you talked about and, and the projections of cases. There's a question from our audience. Uh, whether there have been any data that has pr projected models of where the peak of the curve might be, um, are there any uh, are there any other countries that are on the the right side of the curve? Are there any countries that have have flattened the curve? And and uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that and maybe um, go into a little bit more? You know, why is four thousand cases concerning now? What is the what is the projection? What is the exponential growth that we're looking at here? Yeah, so I don't have all the data on what's happening globally, mostly because it's all changing so quickly and I've been so busy, I've had hardly any time to look at it. So, um, but we do know that in Wuhan, um, there, is a, there has been a dramatic decline. So a lot, many fewer cases are being reported there. They still have new cases, but, um, it's, it's at a very slow trickle compared to what it was. Um, so they've certainly surpassed their peak and they have come down. Um, now what's difficult is the countries that are having uh, major outbreaks now in Europe, uh, we just don't fully have the picture yet, um, partly because by the time the, the explosion of cases is getting to healthcare, um, there's already been transmission in the community at that point for maybe a couple of weeks. Um, so it's hard to see what's coming down the line. There have been a number of papers um, that have looked at different modeling estimates. Um, so there are some predictions out there, but I just don't have those data available to me. 
Great. Well, let me, as we get ready to close, um, let, let's let just ask one, one more question to, from the audience. And um, it goes back to the question around social distancing. And you mentioned communication and the challenges of communicating to people, given that so much of this has to do with individual level decisions, as well as businesses, local and state governments. What is the best strategy to take when trying to convince somebody to, to take social distancing seriously? And do you have practical tips? There's lots of people at home right now with uh, kids who are begging for play dates. Um, you know, is it safe to like wave hello to your neighbor? Can you just share a little bit more of what, where the evidence stands on that? And how can people, um, how can people apply this in their life today? I think the problem with social distancing is that every individual household has access to so many different types of resources. So some families are very able, very easily able to stay home. Um, it may not be easy. You may have kids bouncing off the walls, but at least you have potentially flexible jobs or already one parent stays home already. And so you can keep a more closed household. However, there are lots and lots of households across this country that simply do not have that ability. Um, the people are essential personnel in this healthcare, in public health response, in government, um, service workers, uh, sanitation workers that, that just simply cannot um, be away from their, their employment at this time um, and, and really do need to be working. So, you know, it's okay for children to be in contact with other children, but they should be healthy. And you should try to limit the overall number of contacts that they have. So if you need to share, share child care, try to do so with, you know, maybe one or two other households so that um, the overall network is small. Um, if you need to bring in a babysitter, you know, that can be done, but certainly try to um, not have there be 10 babysitters or 20 babysitters, you know, try to pick one or two that are the, the primary contact. Um, uh, we encourage people to go outside. So we're talking about disease transmission, and when you're in an outdoor setting, the risk of a respiratory uh, virus transmitting is much, much reduced. Um, so children playing outside should be safe. Um, they going on bike rides and walks and hikes and all of that is should be not not of concern. Um, so get the kids out. People need to be out walking, biking, doing the things that they need to do in order to still uh, maintain their their own health and 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 wellness and their mental health during these really challenging times. So I think it, it really depends on what the household's able to do. It also depends on if there's anyone who's high risk in the household. So we know that the elderly and um, those with underlying severe conditions that might make them more susceptible, more medically fragile, um, they're at higher risk. So if you have someone like that in your household, try even harder to keep your household isolated and, and try harder to keep people away from that individual. Um, maybe if they can have their own bedroom, if that's possible, their own bathroom that's designated for them. And if anyone in the household is sick, um, have them self-isolate so that they do not spread to that potentially vulnerable person. Um, so these are all strategies that can be tried. Um, it is it is challenging for sure, and we're just doing our best. Thank you so much. Well, on that note, we really appreciate you joining us today, Dr. Winter, and um, and thank you again for sharing your your time so generously. We know you are spending double time helping your local health department and others uh, grapple with this crisis. So we really appreciate it. For our audience, thank, thank you, you for being with us today for, with our technical difficulties, but we are so glad that you joined us. Please do join us again here tomorrow from noon to 12.30 for a webinar featuring representatives from Ascension and the National Association of County and City Health Officials who will discuss the challenges facing health systems and public health and how they are intersecting. On Friday, we'll be joined by Governor Mike Levitt, who previously served as the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Governor of Utah. He will explore the path forward for policymakers at the federal, state, and local levels. And finally, you can find more information and resources on our website. So thank you again to Dr. Winter for joining us. Thanks to our audience. And please be healthy and be safe. Goodbye for now.